This is a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brighton Central School District Board of Education education meeting for April 27th, 2021. Before I read our COVID update disclaimer on our meeting tonight, I remind folks, anyone joining the meeting tonight from our public, you know, Brighton residents, who wish to make a comment or ask a question during public participation, uh, that will be coming up shortly. So if you are on the Zoom tonight and would like to make a comment or ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and put your name and your address in there and we will call on you shortly and allow you to make your comment or ask a question during public participation. Uh, we Please take note that the Board of Education of the Brighton Central School District in response to the continuing emergency circumstances <laughs> of the COVID-19 pandemic and consistent with the New York State Governor's executive orders, including but not limited to Executive Order 202.1 is conducting its scheduled public business meeting tonight, April 27th, 2021 at 7 p.m. to be held via Zoom and streamed through our website. Uh, the public wishing to offer public comments shall be allowed to do so by participation on uh, the video and Zoom teleconference, as I mentioned earlier. We will call on you shortly. If you wish to uh, address the board, uh, please put your name and address in the chat. Uh, additionally, the public is encouraged to offer any comments or questions that you wish to the board. You can always do that by in writing, by emailing the board directly, or through our board clerk and district clerk, Ms. Kim Lanzafame, and all of that contact information is on the district website. Uh, so you are free to contact us in addition to our regularly scheduled meetings. The minutes tonight will be available uh, after our next meeting when we approve them. And this meeting tonight is also being recorded. It, is, it will be available for viewing uh, by members of the public after tonight's uh, close. At this point, Dr. McGowan, do we have anyone who wishes to participate in public participation? Nobody has indicated so in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. We will continue to move along then. Uh, board, may we have a motion, please, for approval of minutes from the April 13th, 2021 business meeting? So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by Andrea. Does anyone have anything to add, delete, or make a change on those minutes? Hearing none, then all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, the motion is carried and the minutes are approved. Seven, or I'm sorry, six in favor and none opposed. I do make note that our board vice president, Julene Gilbert is unavailable uh, tonight and won't be with us. So there'll be six, there are six of us this evening. Uh, our highlighted evening, our next agenda. Right, can, I, can I interrupt for a second? The yes. Q and, the Q and A has a participant in it, which is different from the chat. Um, okay, hold on one second. All right, let's hold on for a second. I just, I am seeing that too. Thank you, Karen. Mark, we also have to approve the agenda. Thank you. That should be corrected. So my apologies. Uh, there's a Melanie in the Q&A. If you'd like to put into the chat, please go right ahead. And I'd love to uh, bring you up. Mark, did you want name and address in the chat? Well, name and address or name, we, we recognize the name, I think, is a Brighton resident, and uh, she's welcome to join us and give her address uh, when she joins. And okay. then since we have not, uh, since I did not call for a motion for approval of the agenda, it's really ends up being perfect timing anyway on the public participation, so. Okay, hold on one second. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Melanie Burner, go right ahead. You're muted, though. There okay, you can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Welcome. Thank you. Do you want questions in the beginning or toward the end? Public participation is in the beginning of the meeting, and it's right now. So if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can at this point. Okay. Um, do I have a time limit? Three, three minutes. 
three minutes. Okay, can you hold on one second? Um, I guess my first question is, it's been over a year. Um, and other, right now we're able to grocery shop, go to restaurants, Home Depot. I go to meetings at work and I sit in the conference room. So my question is, when are these board meetings live and in person? Well, we will continue to operate not only our board meetings, Mulaney, but our all district group meetings are continuing to operate under Zoom as authorized by the governor. We are minimizing contact and gatherings of groups of people while we emphasize gatherings of students and teachers. So for our efforts right now, uh, we will continue to do so. It allows us to keep our buildings closed in the evening, not have to duplicate cleaning efforts and sanitizing efforts. So we'll continue to hold the meetings this way for the, for the foreseeable future. I don't know when exactly, we have not made a decision on that. So do you have specifically where that's stated that something you can post on the send out or email to where the governor is requiring that? He's not requiring it. He's allowing it under executive order 202.1. Allowing it. Okay. So you're choosing to stay on Zoom. That's correct. Okay. Um, my next question, I, the reopening schools, it seems to be circles going in circles. Um, there's a lot of schools open in other counties and downstate and have been since September. There are other states. The kids have been in five days a week. And what I have seen from Brighton is we want to hire, hire more mental health professionals. And the reason is our kids are not in school. And I just want to know, where is the big problem? Where is the bottleneck? Is it Mendoza? Because it's not Governor Cuomo. I can answer that, Mark, if you'd like. Sure. Uh, two points. One, we're not right now hiring more mental health people. So I'm not sure what that's in reference to. And the second is that the bottleneck is essentially with, yes, with Governor Cuomo as the person who leads the Department of Health as an executive function, because the Department of Health guidance does not allow for six through 12 kids to come back with three feet of distancing while the infection rate is where it is right now. There's no way around that. So that's the, the rule that's in place because we can't cohort six through 12 students. So what I constantly hear is the rule, the guidance, the question I have for this board that we have elected and you as our superintendent, who is standing up for our children and challenging these guidance rules, um, the recommendations? I mean, I just feel like everybody's just taking it. And instead of presenting the research and saying, hey, all these other schools and name locations and how do we get our kids back? Like, I feel like we, if we all work together to push them, instead we're all sitting back and saying, well, they just told us we're gonna throw our hands up and this is how it is. And meanwhile, my nephew in another state has had a full year of a full education and my children have not. So that puts them behind already. Well, I, I can answer from my perspective and then Mark or or anybody else on the board from a board perspective, I, I would say to you that one, th there's an assumption in what you've said that we would want to push back on everything or that we disagree with everything. And I, I don't know that that's entirely the case. I think there have been aspects of this we've disagreed with that we've been pretty vocal about for many months and communicated that pretty clearly. Um, we communicate that regularly and look for flexibility and look for changes and encourage in meetings with Dr. Mendoza, a different way to look at things that might allow more kids to come back. That's a weekly conversation. And we did voice that very clearly, both with the Department of Health, with the governor's office, and with the Finger Lakes Reopening Commission, with our local elected representatives as well, our desire to have them move towards the CDC guidance, which they did do eventually. I'm, I'm the last person that would be defending them or the governor um, ever, but they did move towards that. And now it is simply the infection rate being lower. I can't speak for other states and I don't know why they've done what they've done, but that's our, you know, our concern at the present is the infection rate. Okay, so my third thing is I'm just gonna encourage some critical thinking here. If you do some research on infection rates, the PCR test and understanding how inaccurate it is and starting to question the establishment on what is going on, 
the whole masking of children, there's a large group of us that are we're gonna really start to fight this because the health, everyone concerned that health, masks have been proven not to work um, in social distancing and barriers. And there is a ton of information out there. And I just don't see anybody bringing that forward or bringing another perspective. I feel like it's all, we're just gonna do this and that's it. These kids are suffering. They're having issues. The psychological damage of wearing a mask, especially in young children, if you took any children's behavior development class in college, which I did, the biggest thing they learn from is the face. And I don't understand why people are just going along with it. Kids are coming home with headaches. They have increased anxiety. They have acne problems and pentigo um, affecting their sleep. They're having nightmares. And I just don't see any concern for that at all. I feel let's get the kids in masks and have some sort of, you know, retribution if they don't follow the rules when they know it's unnatural themselves. And I just, I just not seeing another side. I keep feeling the same thing every time I sit on these calls quietly and I'm not going to be quiet anymore. Well, you're welcome to not be quiet and that's fine. I mean, I think there should be respectful disagreement. We don't have a problem with that at all. I will tell you that masking actually with kids has gone very well. There hasn't been a an atmosphere of retribution. Our students have been remarkably responsible in that way. We recognize. I'm just going to say. Is, I'm just. That like, is I could just if I, you're Ma saying Ma in if I could just finish. Mm -hmm. I, I, I heard you out. I'd love to just finish responding, and then you're more than welcome to respond. Our kids actually have, I think, done very well with that. We recognize that it has not uh, been ideal for all kids, and that there's been a challenge for many kids. You know, we referenced mental health before. Yeah, that is a big part of our conversation on how to think about recovery after the situation. Uh, but in the vast majority of cases, I, I, I just feel compelled to say though, as a person who's been involved in this conversation quite a bit, and I think you have also, but I think for the, the public good, I, I don't think I should let sit what you said about evidence that masks don't work or that distancing doesn't work because I've seen volumes of medical evidence in you know, reputable journals, medical journals that have been presented over and over again that show that it does. And in I fact, know. we'd say the reason why we haven't seen transmission in the school age population at school, which has been part of our argument for bringing more kids back, is because they've been so good about masking and about distancing. And frankly, the transmission that has happened in our community, often we find out, is through social events and occasions outside of school when kids are not masked and not distanced. So just Anecdotally, I will tell you that that's been our experience over time. And I would request that you send me those studies and that documentation, and I will send you what I have found. You, you have so sent that me there your, is an equal you know, share of information. You have sent me materials. I, I will tell you that everything that I'm reading is publicly accessible and has been uh, seen, whether it's in the Journal of American Medicine, whether um, it's in The Lancet, several reputable publications. Um, that's I, I, I would just, suggest simply would if you Google the, the success of masking. Um, I hope you do are all aware of the censorship going on right now. Um, and just saying to Google does not work anymore. You have to look at alternative resources. And I'm just putting that out there for anybody else who wants to do their own research. There is so much out there and so much coming that people are not aware of. I would again say our anecdotal experience though in school has been with masking and distancing, we are not seeing spread. And where we know that happens outside of school where there is spread, it is every single time been when people are not masked and when they're not distanced. So publications aside, I will tell you just experientially over the past year that has been very consistent. Okay, we appreciate your involvement. Thank you, Lenny. Oh, I'll be back. Thank you. Yeah, well, I do think in the interest of full disclosure to the public, I think it's important that I state as board president that Melanie is a resident of Brighton. She's well known to us. She has written us frequently. She has contacted us frequently during the entire pandemic. Uh, she disagrees, I would say, with most of what we have decided to do. And we are compelled to act in the public interest and in the interest of safety of all our students, our faculty, anyone in our buildings, and we continue to do so. We follow the guidance and guidance in this case is regulation that we're required to follow and that right now we've got our K-5 students back in person. It's gone very well and that the secondary students, we have to get that 
infection rate down under 100 cases on a seven day rolling average. And when it does, we'll be ready to act on that. I also have to publicly disclose that Mullaney is a named party in a lawsuit suing the district along with all other Monroe County districts. So I think that the public needs to know that. Uh, now we will move on and uh, I will call on the board please for a motion to approve the agenda this evening. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's six in favor and none opposed. Thank you. Okay, picking up again, we did approve our minutes. Should we approve them again, Kim, just because we were off agenda? Are we okay with the- uh... No, I think we're fine, Mark. I got it. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, moving along. Dr. Debbie Baker is with us tonight to, to provide uh, it, a, a update to us on innovation, innovative learning and really highlighting tonight our culturally responsive practices. So Dr. Baker, thank you very much. Well, perfect. I thought that there was another item before me, so I guess I'm thrilled. All right, so give me a second. Let me share my screen, if you will. I think we had a dual titling of your- Oh, gotcha. All right. Um, all right. So to get us started tonight, as you said, Mark, Really, I appreciate the opportunity every year um, to kind of come to the board at this point in time to kind of share some in the innovative practices, what's going on across the district, kind of just that, that window, if you will, into our classrooms. Um, tonight, no different, although it seemed to me as I was thinking about this presentation, it made sense because we've been about for the last three to four years, three definitely, really seriously diving deep into this study of what does it mean to be culturally responsive. And so I thought tonight that I would provide you with a kind of a glimpse, a glance, if you will, into our classrooms, not saying that all of our classrooms are there, but we certainly are starting to see evidence of the professional development that we've been doing over the last few years and starting to see it actually come into play. So when we think about culturally responsive practices, and actually the world that I work in, obviously, it's really all about the curriculum and the instructional side of the house, right? So, you know, as we think about that, our first initial reaction is, oh, we're just gonna buy some diverse tech. And really, that's really not what it's all about. And so thinking about, you know, what we're doing from an instructional side, these might not be practices that we really evidently see, but rather these are practices that are just part of our normal landscape of being. Certainly it goes beyond that notion of just providing our students with multicultural representations, right? We really want our students to learn how to be learners. We wanna develop their metacognition so that they in turn can take control and become independent learners that we want them to be. We know that research says that historically students of color tend to be more dependent learners and really moving towards a more independent state for all of our students builds their intellectual capacity and then ultimately helps them to be more successful in life. On the curriculum side of the house, we have of late been really referencing the work of Goldie Muhammad. Goldie talks about, Muhammad talks about like looking through curriculum from four basic lenses. And my hope tonight in the next few slides is to kind of share with you some examples of where these lenses are coming to life. First and foremost, we wanna make sure that what we're teaching kids, the curriculum, really helps them see their identity, helps them become to know themselves as learners, know themselves as individuals, and then also look towards others as their own and, and I guess appreciate their own identity. We were first introduced to this concept a few years ago during our DPD day. Um, where all the uh, faculty attended through J uh, Dr. Javon Hunter, when he talked about this idea of windows and mirrors and making sure that our students were eligible, not eligible, but also um, exposed to the ability to see themselves, as I said, as learners, but also see others. We, you know, clearly the purpose of school is right to help kids gain knowledge and help them gain skills. So that's really important in Muhammad's framework. We wanna make sure that kids are developing the skills, students are developing the skills that they need. And we wanna kind of check, is our curriculum allowing them to do that? At the same time, is it allowing them to gain the knowledge that they need um, to be able to think critically and act responsibly? And then the last facet of Muhammad's framework really thinks about criticality. 
this social justice aspect, if you will. You know, are we providing our students with the opportunities to engage in um, uh, thinking, engage in acts where they are um, looking at oppression, looking at, looking at equity and disrupting that in whatever their span of influence is. Um, some of you may relate this to um, Ibram Kendi, whose work is how to be an anti-racist. This is kind of the anti-racist aspect, aspect of that work. It's how to be proactive and be a contributing member of society. So as we think about our classrooms and we think about how this manifests itself, I offer to the board and the community the first example through our studio art class where a recent unit that was developed um, entitled Monuments of Me, really Monuments of Me, really asks of our students to reflect on who they are. What are they proud of? What are they, you know, how do they define themselves? And the questions here, I'm not going to read them to you, really are, um, uh, we give them, the students, uh, like a writing experience to, to really delve deep into, again, their own personal identity, identities. From there, the students are exposed to a number of different types of um, uh, ceramic-based sculptures, mediums that they can use to then uh, create themselves and to depict who they are as individuals. Um, before I go on any further, I would invite the board and then ultimately this will be on our website. I've added into your board min minutes this evening. Um, it's an addendum because as I started to gather information, um, for this particular presentation from our teachers. It was overwhelming the numbers of examples that were shared. And you know, if I were to share them all, we would be here for a solid hour. There's so many good things going on. And so I offer you this addendum just to kind of further develop what's happening in our classroom and represent some of the really good work that's, that's going on there. So again, Looking at this, um, in this particular example, this is a student who then, and ultimately within this unit of study, created a sculpture of herself and then added the reflection because that was part of the whole work um, of what this reflection meant to her. I'm sorry, what the sculpture meant to her. She talked about being happy and how this represented um, uh, the peace sign that uh, symbolizes the love and need for peace, as well as the blue swirls representing freedom and free flowing happiness in the air. This is how this particular student um, saw herself and wanted to represent herself. You'll notice as I go through our, a lot of our examples tonight, we've really started over the past few years to embed a lot of reflection in. This speaks to the cultural responsive practice of really helping students understand themselves as learners and think about what they need and what, how what they're being asked to do really helps them to become better human beings. In this next example, actually, I've shared this with the board um, in previous occasions. I believe um, you know that as a district, we have, been, um, we have been participating in a regional effort um, that was actually started by or incited by our, uh, uh, the Monroe County superintendents where they tasked our, um, our teachers to really think deeply about the role of Rochester and what it played with regards to the history. And so these two representations of, are the units of inquiry. They're not total units of study, but smaller, shorter units um, that are for uh, our eighth grade and for our 11th grade teams. And so all of our teachers now in those grade levels have been through the professional development and this spring and then subsequently into next year will be using these units, piloting now, but then using them to the more fullest extent. So in eighth grade, the, um, the sample unit is called How to Word Shape History. And so again, thinking about how we help students understand where they sit and where their place in history is. And in this particular situation, how Rochester situates itself and how it has influenced the things that they are learning and the community as a whole. So in this particular unit, students learn about um, words and how history is shaped, how history is both told as well as it's created depending upon the author. And students learn to become somewhat discerning consumers, if you will, of information, thinking critically about who's telling the story, whose story is not being told, and how does that influence what it is that's actually being depicted in any given situation. 
at the 11th grade, we move to a more demographic geographic situation where students are learning about redlining. And I'm sure the board has heard in many, you know, in many different instances and examples of a lot, this, this has been a really hot button issue, hot button topic um, in our community these days. And so our students will be learning about how redlining has impacted not only um, the, the systemic racism that's happened or that is happening currently, but how we can do things about, how we can do something about it um, for the future. This is one of my favorite units. This, is, this was developed a few years ago by the fifth grade team at, um, in ELA. It's, it's um, based upon a number of texts and a number of media where we begin to really help students understand this concept of human rights and what that means and with respect to privilege and those who perhaps don't have such privilege. Our goal for this particular unit is really to, as it says here, widen the lenses of students. You know, at fifth grade, students are very capable of learning about others and others' experiences and how they may differ from their own. And then start to gain a sense of what does it mean to be privileged versus what does it mean to not and to be oppressed? And what can we do about it? Many of these units of study, as you'll see, really have as a performance task, some sort of a call to action to make a difference in a particular community or a particular uh, sphere of influence. This unit goes on and ends with, once again, student reflections. In this particular example, students were asked to select one of the terms and concepts that, were had, that had been discussed. And in this particular example that I'm showing here, the student really started, really um, talked about uh, the word fair and how she had learned how a sense of fairness was different depending upon certain populations and how she perhaps was subject to more what she would consider to be fairness than those populations that were perhaps more oppressed. Again, I invite the Board of Education and ultimately community to reference the addendum that I, that I put together because there's a lot of different examples of the student reflective piece in this particular unit of study. And then finally at Council Rock, you know, we move down to how does, how, what are we doing within our curriculum to really diversify our text, to expose students to not only a number of different authors, but a number of different perspectives so that they can, as a window, start to understand themselves as, as, as little people, as little human beings, but also to understand the experiences of others. In addition to that, you know, the morning meetings, the calendar times are perfect opportunities for teachers to embed in um, representations or discussions of other cultures, how they celebrate holidays, and what, what's meaningful to them. And this last bullet, this last example, I really wanted to make sure to point out because I thought that, that this was particularly um, illustrative, especially this year um, in our remote classrooms, how you know, one of the silver linings of COVID and quite frankly, Zoom has really allowed our teachers as lens into our students' lives and help them to really understand and um, better learn about our students and their experiences and where they're coming from. Um, you know, the, the teacher who shared this particular example with me was saying it's not out of the ordinary for, you know, for grandmas or aunts to come on and, you know, say hello to the class and say hello to the, you know, say hello to the teacher and um, really, uh, you know, get to know the families, if you will, more so than what we've been able to do in the past with just our, our brick and mortar classroom. So I wanted to point out this particular um, example that one of the teachers shared because I thought it was particularly rele relevant um, during the time of COVID. So when we move to the instructional side of the house, right, this information processing, we rely heavily on the work of Zaretta Hammond. Um, members of our curriculum council, Mark, Karen, Andrea, I know you'll recognize a lot of this work in Zaretta Hammond's name. She, uh, she wrote the book, Cultural Responsive Teaching and the Brain, where she really starts to look at um, the brain and the neuroscience and how, that, and how learning happens and start to think about that through a culturally responsive lens. And in Hammond's work, there are four different uh, uh, stages, if you will, in a learning process that need to happen, in particular for our, de our dependent learners, as well as our independent learners in order to make learning really take place. 
And I'll be going through each one of these and giving, them giving you examples of how these manifest themselves in our classrooms. First, we start out with the input stage, right? That idea of making learning relevant, right? Peaking students' interests, um, trying to build on their own funds of knowledge, right? What are they bringing to the situation that we can capitalize on, build on their own respective schemas? So what you're seeing here is an example of first grade, an empathy map that Andrea Yaman, um, our, our uh, extended studies teachers, who by the way happens this year to be taking on teaching all of our first graders um, at Council Rock Science. And so Andrea had um, students develop empathy maps, where as you see here, you know, students commented on what did they like to listen to, what did they like to do, um, you know, just really providing Andrea with a lens into the lives of each one of those. And she circled here this idea of building forts because in this particular example, she said a number of kids, right? First graders, right? First graders love to build forts. And so she was able to capitalize on that in subsequent lessons and learning, you know, um, in particular in science. Um, and while I'll be referencing that over the next couple of slides, they were doing a study of light, right? So she could use forts to talk about, you know, the light that you might find in a fort and what, you know, was it dark, was it light and what caused that light within that. Again, building on a student's interest because she had a number of students who said, I like to build forts. I know the Board of Education has heard several times over the last few years about the work that the district has been doing district-wide in restorative practices, and in particular, building community circles. So full disclosure, this is a pre-COVID picture, so you know, don't be alarmed, but we are also building community circles within our own Zoom remote environments this year. But when we think about what building a community circle does, and how it relates to or aligns to the premises or the, the um, tenets of cultural responsive practices. Community circles not only help us build relationships with students, we build those relationships by understanding or knowing or coming to learn what each child, what, what's important to them, what's not important to them, what they think about things, and really helping us understand each child at the individual level. That's what a community building circle does. And so this practice, really goes a long way towards helping teachers as they design lessons um, that will meet each individual students um, where they are and what their needs are. In this next example, and I apologize, but I'm actually going to read, um, read the, from uh, Andrea's words because I think she really says it best. In this next particular example, or in the next picture, uh, this next stage, we ignite students, right? This is where we wake up their brains. We get them interested in learning. We pique their curiosity. We, you know, we, again, we're building on what we've learned during the input stage, and we've really sparked a motivation for that learning to happen. So in this particular example, Andrea shares um, that she made up a story. She told them that the king and queen of habits of mind, right? It wouldn't be Council Rock if it weren't about the habits of mind, recently learned that the treasure chest of jewels had been stolen from the kingdom and they had been tracked to a cave on a remote island. I'm getting to the curriculum part. Several sailors had tried to retrieve the jewels but had been scared away by glowing sea creatures and creepy darkness in the cave. Again, you see where aspects and teachings of light are going to come in here. Eerie shadows cave on the cave walls and strange flashes of light. The kingdom's pirate, Curly haired Carly was employed by the king and queen to journey to the island as she invited all of them to study the scientific process and the scientific information in search of these jewels. So in the end, they learned that everything was about recovering the jewels from the cave, which of course, if you're a first grader, that's super, super important. So they, she's taken the, the interest she's of the students as well as contrived a very interesting story to lead them into, or as, at, as, as uh, Madeline Hedberg called, the anticipatory set of learning about light and learning about its impact um, and, and how it all works. In this particular example, we're moving to the middle school. We're moving to a French class where um, students in French seven and eight this year um, actually participated in a national con uh, contest. It was based upon the, the um, Sweet 16 or the, the, you know, the, the 
brackets, if you will, about the same time. But what the students were doing is they, it was called Monty Music Hall, and students were asked to judge French songs. Now these French songs had been written by composers from around the world, French speaking countries. And so the students would come in every day and they would listen to the songs, they would dissect them, they would learn the vocabulary that they may perhaps didn't know in the songs, they would learn the phraseology as well as learn about the culture of that particular country from which the song, um, from which the song had originated. It was a highly motivating task for the students and again represents really that stage where we were we um, ignite students um, unique curiosities. Uh, Robin Newcomer, the uh, teacher that shared this with me, said that, you know, 100% of the kids highly engaged in this, very, very involved, um, would come in and just be humming the tunes to these songs, and, you know, in French, of all things, and really um, learning not only facilitating, learning of the language, but and learning about the culture in a very highly motivational way. This next, next example is from a high school math class. And um, it represents open-ended responses. So why are those necessarily um, culturally responsive? Open-ended responses really provide for multiple entry points. So whether or not you're a student who very quickly picks up on concepts or one who really needs to mull over them before you can learn, an open-ended response really allows multiple entry points into the work, into the learning that we want students to be doing. That coupled with group work really helps students, and I'm going to share with you some reflections about how it helps students really um, solidify the concepts and the skills that we're trying to teach. In this particular example, um, students were presented with a situation, we all remember the kind of that pay it forward concept. And so they were given a scenario of a student who was tasked with providing uh, uh, coming up with an idea that would evoke world change, if you will, through a pay it forward concept. Our math students were tasked with coming up with a mathematical formula, some sort of a, a representation of what that would look like mathematically. They worked in groups um, and, and kind of shared ideas and really came up with some very unique situations. When we look at what the students said about how that work had helped them, I think this really represents, you know, what it is that we're trying, what, what it is we want for students um, by creating really safe learning environments where they're willing to take risks. So we've got students saying, you know, group work. Um, it, it allows me to bounce ideas off of someone else. It helps me, I love learning with a partner. It helps me feel comfortable asking questions. And then again, the comment at the end, when you put us in breakout rooms and I do something wrong, people are there to help me. People are there and I can help them. So it really, I think, shows that in a culturally responsive classroom, learning isn't individualized, but rather it's coming off of a collectivist um, stance. It really is learning collectively together for, um, for a common goal. This next example comes out of fifth grade social studies. Um, our units of design, our units development over the last few years has really been um, focused on an understanding by design framework where we start by asking an essential question, right? This lends itself or this aligns directly with this stage that Hammond would say is about piquing students' curiosity by asking challenging, thought-provoking questions. And in this particular unit, students are asked at the very beginning, what can citizens do to change things in a dem democracy? They start there and they move to the next stage of Hammond's um, information processing, where we are, she calls it the chew stage, right? We're asking students to make meaning by engaging the brain, um, thinking through, through things we use, protocols to do that. Um, again, you may have heard me reference on several occasions the making thinking visible strategies or protocols. Our, we have many, many teachers who have been for, through this training and are starting to incorporate these into the classroom. In this particular example, this teacher used the see, think, wonder, where students were given, in this particular case, two examples, two pictures um, from the civil rights movement, movement. They were asked to, by themselves, really delve into the pictures, um, given a, a graphic organizer, what do you see in these pictures? 
What does this make you think? What do you think is happening? So they're processing this. They're processing this individually. And then ultimately they're processing it in groups. And at the end, what does it make you wonder? Using protocols slows down the thinking. It really allows all students, not just those who are quick to answer or may have some background information about the topic to answer, but rather allows all students to do the thinking that they need to do in order to do the learning. At the end of this particular um, lesson, students were asked and engaged in a, uh, a class-wide discussion on based on what you saw, based on what you read, what might this show about the role of citizens in our country? And the teachers went on to share, the teacher went on to share how students were reflecting on the role of citizens is to vote, the role of citizens is to pay taxes, to serve on juries, a number of different examples that they had been learning about and in this particular um, situation, they also came up with one of the roles of citizen is to speak up when things are unjust. Again, one example of how we are building these concepts, building these skills and these dispositions, these thinking dispositions into our classrooms. All right, I'm not sure why I'm not advancing. Let me see if I can get to the next one. Hmm. What did the students say about this? Again, thinking about the reflection, reflections, asking them, how did this help you be a learner? Here's what we're hearing. It helps us make it, make it, um, look at things more carefully. Again, slows down our thinking. This is from the mouths of our fifth grade students. Every, when you type everything out in your head, it gets all your thoughts on the head it, uh, uh, that are in your head onto the paper. That way students are more um, motivated, more um, have more confidence in sharing and contributing. It's easier to concentrate because it makes you focus. In this next example, it comes from a geometry classroom at the high school. Again, full disclosure, it's a pre-COVID example, but I thought it relevant. Here again, we have seen um, uh, an increased use of whiteboards. And these are large, uh, larger whiteboards um, where students work in teams, they work in pairs, um, to respond to, or in this particular case, they were asked to make like a whiteboard poster to explain um, some of the properties of quadrilaterals. And so what they were doing, they were given prompts and um, they would uh, create those on their own boards. And then they would move to another group's boards to kind of see how they had processed the information. Again, I think this is a real uh, representation of how um, this allows us to make thinking visible, not only for students to learn and, and kind of gauge how they're processing information, but for the teacher to understand how kids are thinking and whether or not there are misconceptions that need to be, um, that need to be clarified before she, he or she moves on in the lesson. Now, this is a video, and so I'm hoping that it's going to show, and let's see if I can get it to run. And if not, I'll just move on. Here we go. You're seeing a lot of discussion, lots of dialogue happening as students are processing, they're chewing on, if you will, their learning. And then the last stage of Hammond's framework really asks us as educators to help students review, help them to consolidate or synthesize the learning that they're doing in order to make that learning stick. And so in this particular example, I share with you it's a circle back around to the first grade science unit on life, where students were tasked to um, think about how animals use light in order to survive. And what these three pictures depict are students' representations of that. They were tasked with designing their own land or sea animal, a mascot that could be used on that ship that we talked about a little bit earlier when they embarked upon their treasure, uh, their treasure hunt to retrieve the jewels. In this particular example, again, coming back, coming back to or circling back around to the fifth grade example and the entire letter um, I have included in the addendum, um, students were tasked to uh, write to um, a, a representative of an organization that was currently making a difference and not only share what they felt was important and what they were learning about, but then also challenge this organization 
to go beyond. And in this particular example, um, this student wrote to the ACLU, um, the director of the ACLU, uh, the New York State Civil Liberties Union, really um, uh, emphasizing um, the need for this particular organization to think more deeply about how discrimination was impacting our, our um, people um, uh, of color. And then the last example I offer to the board this evening um, comes out of our middle school music orchestra, um, orchestra classes. Um, in this particular unit of study, um, a student, uh, sorry, the teacher um, tried to bridge the gap between the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, really teaching students not only about the history, but more importantly in her world, what music has done over the years, over the centuries to impact or to communicate a message. And in this particular example, um, she used the piece of We Shall Overcome. And in addition to teaching the students about um, the history of these particular time periods, what music was doing. And so as a final performance task, that kind of review piece, right, that review opportunity to solidify that, yearn that, that learning, um, students were um, required to use the, the, the um, tune of We Shall Overcome pick a relevant topic or a topic of their choosing that they wanted to take a stand on and then develop their own set of lyrics um, commenting on that particular, uh, that particular issue. The teacher's reflection, and I appreciated her sharing this in really ultimately her unit goals, as you can see here. She wanted them to have a real understanding of how peaceful protests and nonviolent resistance brought, bring about change. She also wanted them to understand that it can continue to work today and that they can be a part of history that they choose to make. And so kind of as a wrap up, I share with you, you know, our ultimate goal, as I said to you and I started out, is to make sure that all of our students leave Brighton being independent thinkers, able and willing to contribute to um, a more global society. And in doing that, we really want to um, address all of their needs individually um, and bring them from not only where they are and respect that and embrace that, but also to help them to become the citizens that we know that they can be. And that is it. With that, I'll stop my share and turn it over to the board for any questions. Oh, I won't stop my share. Debbie, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I do want to open it up to the board for any question or comment, but I, I think, you know, what a remarkable uh, display, you know, when, when you sent it and posted it to us earlier in the week for us to take a look at, um, you know, what a, I mean, this, the broad, the broadness and the depth of the work across grade levels, curricular levels, the student voices, the addendum that you referenced, there's a lot of visual work in there from students. Uh, you know, I think it's really even though that we continue to all discuss the ongoing nature of the work and we continue to reassess and, and reevaluate and hear about what's next in terms of steps, I think seeing this in this slideshow together with the visual, um, to see really where we are on a snapshot in time on our culturally responsive practice work, uh, and only a, a portion of it, you know, that you could put into the whole thing, but what a, what a great snapshot and um, thank you very much you know, for sharing it and for the way that you put it together. Uh, board members, does anyone have any questions or comments for uh, Dr. Baker on what we I, I have a comment for that. I was so, so moved by that. <laughs> that was so beautiful. Um, and the things that really struck out to me, Debbie, that I wanted to mention, um, when studying the civil rights movement, I love that you had the students look at the pictures and take their time. And you pointed out the fact that by giving everyone a moment to process, you sort of equalize where everyone's coming at it from. Because like you said, the kids who are always quick to respond, it gives them a moment to pause, lets the other kids think about it. And even if you have no background knowledge of it, you come to it equally. I love that. Um, that'll serve the students well too, as they learn about art and how to study art and how to sit and look and observe for a while. I love that. And also seeing the students on the whiteboard, um, you know, just bringing back some of those like tactile experiences because some of our kids do learn more tactilely. I love that you're, we are creating opportunities for all different learners. So I just, I was really 
that's very inspirational. So thank you for the presentation. Fabulous, yeah. thanks. And I, I guess I would say, I'm glad that's the message that you got because that's exactly it. You know, one of the things that we realized early on and, and more so now that you're not gonna walk into a room and see this big sign, we're being culturally responsive, right? It's just the nuances of what teachers are doing and the experiences that they're providing with students that really are inclusive to all students for sure. I, I also noticed sort of a common thread through all of what we saw, Debbie, which is, it's physical and that people are up and moving and doing things as opposed to a teacher facing a class of 20 students. Everybody's up, they're involved, they're moving, they're thinking. And I think that's so important. Some of the reading we've been doing talks about engagement, how to engage, how to engage more. And a lot of those kids were clearly an active dialogue, but they weren't at a desk like this sort of facing a teacher. They were up, moving around in the classroom, working in cohorts with students. Um, and I just saw that in a lot of the pictures. That was really great. I also wanted to say, I love the multidisciplinary aspect of all of this. You know, that they're getting this kind of uh, critical thinking in, in, in art and in music, in their writing. You know, I think that's wonderful for all of our kids to have that experience. You know, and, you know, good point, Christina, in mathematics, you know, you had the the math uh, examples there, Debbie, uh, algebra, geometry. I mean, you know, I remember for those of us involved in curriculum council, some of the earliest work around was uh, these discussions among our teachers, uh, subject matter wise. You know, you, right. you tend to think that this type of effort and initiative fits well in uh, social studies classes, history classes, English with literature, but it, it's really all encompassing and we really. I think we've really uh, shown that and, uh, and, and the work around that has crossed all lines. And I, the other element you mentioned it and it struck me again, very early on, we also talked about what does a classroom look like that's culturally responsive? You know, what, what artwork is on a wall? What books are there for a student to choose on their own? What, you know, just how is a room laid out? And so, so much beyond the actual, as Larry said, uh, uh, you know, an instructor in front of a room. So, uh, so again, thank you. And, you know, I think thank you to our principals, our teachers, our building leaders, our department heads, everybody, uh, the commitment to the work, the ongoing continuous work and commitment to it is so important. We know we're committed to it and to see so many things moving along that path are really important when we all would recognize and admit that uh, we have a long way to go in so many ways. But I think uh, you know, thanks are in order for for all to continue to keep nose to the grindstone to keep it going. So thank you. Fabulous. I agree. I mean, our teachers are doing incredible work. I'm looking at Nicole, and I mean, you know, I could have pulled 17 examples out of her classroom alone. It just, you know, again, I don't want to imply that we've arrived. It certainly is a journey that we're on, but it is definitely a feel good when we start to see some of these experiences that our students are being afforded and how that's really helping them broaden their perspective, for sure. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. All right, and uh, we have one item of business uh, remaining this evening board. Uh, a motion, please, for approval of the election tellers for the 2021 budget vote and election, uh, as outlined in the memo from Kim previously given to us. So moved. Second. That's moved by Karen, right, and seconded by Larry. And just a reminder before we call the question, uh, when we uh, were required by law to change to the electronic voting machines a few years ago, we also are required, and as a matter of practice now, utilizing the Monroe County election inspectors. So this list are uh, Monroe County election inspectors, and uh, they are paid for their work, and they are responsible for the efforts that day in the room. As we have publicized on the website and will continue to do so, uh, absentee ballots, write-in style ballots are available. Uh, the governor did finally sign the legislation on no uh, utilizing the COVID pandemic as a reason for requesting a ballot. So if you wish to receive an absentee ballot, that information is posted on the website. Otherwise, we will be voting in person on May 18th, uh, utilizing the uh, central office building. And we'll continue to highlight that information. It is posted. If you have any questions, 
please send an email to Ms. Lands of Fame, our district clerk, board clerk, and she will get back to you. Can I just point out one more thing before yes. we um, call the motion? Uh, they are also trained by the Monroe County Board of Elections. Correct. I'd like to point that out to the public. Yes, they are independent completely. We don't train them, if you will, Karen, you're right there. It's the their equipment, their, their training, they oversee and they're in the building in the room that entire day. So, correct, thank you. Uh, all in favor, please. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Then that's six in favor and none opposed. Uh, prior to adjournment, uh, Dr. McGowan, anything further this evening? Board members, any other items of business this evening? Nothing for me. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, then prior to adjourning, I just want to remind folks, May 11th is our next board meeting, and that will also be a legally required budget hearing that night. So Tuesday, May 11th, and then Tuesday, May 18th is the uh, election day board vote or budget vote day. So we'll continue to remind folks, uh, stay tuned to the website for any updates or changes to that information. Uh, I will entertain, please, a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss the employment of a specific individual, please. So move. Second. Moved by Andrea and seconded by Christina. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Six in favor, none opposed. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. This has been a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education.